Cassie, we good to go? Do we see Aaron? I do not. I think we have a we have four. Oh, Danny's here, so we do have a quorum, so we can go Excellent. ahead. And... Great. I'm going to go ahead and call the February eighth, two thousand twenty-two meeting of the Missoula Park and Recreation Board to order. Um, Cassie, can we start with a roll call, please, and then um, some words about how the Zoom meeting will run? Yes. Start with roll call. Dale. Wendy? Here. John? Here. Sonia? Here. Danny? Here. Margie? Here. And Aaron? I see Aaron's connecting right now. We have a quorum. Excellent. And then just some general words on, we have a few callers right now. I see at least two. Um, any public comments, you're able to raise your hand or lower your hand for a comment. When you raise your hand, I will, will acknowledge you during the public comment period. Star nine is to raise your hand. Star nine is to lower your hand. That is our instruction. Thank you, Cassie. Um, it looks like we have a pretty full agenda today as well. So I'd also like to ask uh, park board members to use the raise your hand feature on the bottom of the Zoom call so that we can try to uh, be as efficient as possible and best use of our time. Um, we're going to start off with administrative business. Um, item 1.2 is approval of the minutes from the January 11th, 2022 meeting. Can I have a motion? This is Wendy. I move to approve the January 22nd minutes. Thanks, Wendy. Is there a second? This is Margie. This I move so to nice second. Edit. Thank you very much. Any edits, comments, or corrections? Hearing none, can we take a roll call vote? Cassie? Apologies, I was on mute. John? Aye. Sonia? Aye. Wendy? Aye. Danny? Aye. Margie? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Thank you. Moving on to item 1.3, are there any non-agenda item announcements to make from any members of the park board? There are none. Okay, Hi. and I see Donna raise her hand. So any comments from announcements from staff or from Donna? Uh, I'm going to defer to Neil. Thank you. I have some news to share with the park board that I've accepted another job and will be leaving the city and the parks department at the end of the month. Congratulations, Neil. Thanks, John. Uh, what are you going to be doing? I am going to the Forest Service to be the landscape architect for the Bitterloo and Flathead National Forest. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, you congratulations, been... Neil. Thanks, everyone. I've really appreciated um, everyone over the years and all the support you guys have given. And so, yeah, I look back on this time dearly. So thank you. And it I has been to... a real joy to work with you, Neil. And uh, um, I, it, I hope this doesn't sound too cliche, but just to watch you grow as a person and as a professional has been really wonderful to see. So best wishes for you. Thanks, John. And something the board doesn't get to see a lot is Neil provides an, an immense amount of leadership, not only for our department, but citywide as it relates to development and works with more um, external um, and city agencies uh, than I do. 
And so he is very much the face of the department on land use, planning, development, and uh, design and construction. So thank you, Neil, for your service. Thank you, Donna. Any more staff announcements? Seeing none, we'll move on to item 1.4, and this is public or guest comments on non-agenda items. If you'd like to comment, please um, raise your hand and be recognized. There's no comment. Okay, we're gonna move then into our action items. And the first action item is item 2.1, renaming request for Pine View Ice Rink. Um, Morgan's name was on this, but I'm gonna go ahead and just make the referral and give some background. Um, in my role at Friends of Missoula Parks, we uh, work closely with the Pine View Park volunteer folks. And over the last couple of months, I've learned so much more than I ever did. And I've hoped that people have had an opportunity to, to read some of the letters of recommendation and the comments and the referral on renaming the Pine View Ice uh, after Bill Beavis. Um, I'd also like to just point out that we do have some current city policy that um, uh, addresses this matter. And normally parks and trails are not named after living persons, except uh, in the event that an individual family or an organization has donated the land for a new park or donated more than 60% of the cost of developing the park or facility or has established a maintenance endowment of 60% more or more on the, of the projected maintenance cost for 20 years. And, this, and such donation is made with the stipulation that the name is a condition of the land or monetary donation. That's the phraseology. Um, what I learned though, is that Bill has been involved up at Pine View long before it was a city park. He's been involved up there for 46 years, making ice, including probably thousands of nights in the middle of the night working with a slew of volunteers, his, his commitment to the ice and to our community is um, a really amazing example. And uh, a couple of months ago, I was contacted by Polly Donaldson and a group of folks that were uh, leading this effort. And um, I can't say enough how much I support this and think that this is um, really do justice for all that Bill has done. So, um, I'm gonna be bringing the referral forward. We have a couple of guests that we want to have the opportunity to speak before we make the motion. And I, I'm hoping that the Zoom links are all straightened out. The first one is Bill's daughter, MC Jenny. Um, MC, are you there? An example. And uh, a couple of months ago, I was contacted by Polly Donaldson and a group of folks that were uh, leading this effort. Oh. And, uh, hey, I MC, we can hear you. You might want to mute the, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Sorry, we were having problems connecting uh, and they were watching it and online and there's a bit of a delay between the two. So I think MC's there now. Can you hear us, MC? Go ahead and unmute. The Zoom link. Yes, I can hear up. you. The first one is Bill's daughter, MC Jenny. Can you hear uh, me? MC, are you yes, but we can also hear the delay from the park board meeting. Could you turn it down on Tom's computer? How about now? Oh, oh that's God. wonderful. Now I can't hear them, Tom. I know. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what you just did. I turned volume down. Okay. We got two things running at once. So I can't hear you right now. Just nod your heads if you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Can you see me? No. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure how to make myself MC's seen. there now. Can you hear us, MC? <laughs> yes. I'm going to go ahead, go ahead and, and unmute. turn you down. I'm unmuted. Like yes, I can hear you. The first okay. one is Bill's daughter, MC. Oh, my gosh. Jenny. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry for this confusion. As long as you guys are nodding and yes, you can hear me, then I'm gonna go ahead. I'm sorry you can't see me. We're having trouble, um, obviously, with technology. 
I was kind of nervous to speak to the park board, but I didn't realize it was going to be because of the technology. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> here I am. Um, as I understand it, I am to speak for about three minutes about um, Bill, just to give you three minutes. Yep. Just to give you an idea of who Bill is. Um, and so here I am. Bill Beavis has been my stepdad for nearly 50 years. And um, I hear that that qualifies me to tell you some stories about him. 46 of those years, he's made ice at Pine View Park and um, has been a person to hold an amazing vision and carry it through with his passion for, for making ice. Um, Bill doesn't know yet that we're making this proposal and the neighbors are, on, are doing this on his behalf. And he would want me to say that he has never He's never worked on the rink alone, really. He has had a lot of help along the way. For example, in 1974, when he moved to Missoula, um, he, he, he looked around Missoula for ice, didn't find any. He came here to be a, accepting a position as a professor of American literature at the university. And um, he found a location at Pineview that was just, um, he saw it as, a place of great potential. He knew that the fire department was trying to make ice up there with fire hoses. And he said to himself, you know, yes, I think I can do this. Um, he has always, he moved from the west, uh, he moved from the east to the west. And he has always been invested in the notion of place and what places mean to people and what makes these places special. And I think his making of the ice represents that. He co-created the Montana Writers Course at the university. He co-edited the um, Last Best Place with Bill Kittredge and Onyx Smith. He's also, he's always been invested in how, in, how to make our places more important. Um, I thought I'd tell a few stories about the, the funny inside backstories about him. Uh, there was a trio back in the seventies of um, Paul, um, Paul and uh, I'm forgetting the other person's name, um, who has have been his partners in making ice for a long time. And over the years, he has just gathered vol community volunteers. It wasn't always easy. Um, originally, there was one key to the shed that helped them make ice. And it, the big deal was always Bill asking, where's the key? Who has the key? Paul has the key. No, I have the key. I don't know where the key is. Things have come a long way since then. Um, questions in our house in the wintertime were often, well, where's Bill? Where Bill's at the rink, of course. Bill was at the rink for, a. he would go to the rink. I asked my mom, it was about five times a day through the winter. And if he went twice a day, it was always the, the first visit was how's the ice. And the second visit would be, I want to go up and see who's there. Um, the other joy of his in making this ice is uh, he's always felt helped. You know, when, when the rink became part of the city, he speaks so highly of work, how it was, how it is to work with Donna Gockler and other people um, along the way. And I think there's something really special about the way Bill communicates in a community. He, he had kids, he used to come home and be, he'd be like, damn it, the kids trashed the ice again. They just don't get it. I'm gonna to have to go up and talk to the principal of Rattlesnake School again. And what that was really about, it wasn't about anger or retaliation or I've gotta make these people understand. It was always about teaching people the value of the rink. And in doing that, kids and the people around, him, around here started appreciating the value of community through the creation of the ice. Um, another story is he used to come home too and say, oh, the Russians, the Russians are on the ice. It was a group of Russian uh, kids who would come up and play hard on that ice. And they just didn't understand that actually, you know, there's a system here and there's a, a guy and a couple of guys who take care of the ice. And he got to know them and got their respect and their, in, they understood then what it takes to actually make the ice. Uh, sitting around Christmases with Bill, there we are opening stockings on Christmas morning and Bill is 
saying, okay, I need a red ribbon. Where's a red ribbon? And we're all going, what do you need a red ribbon for? And he, he wanted the red ribbon to put on his sign Christmas morning for everyone to know the rink is open and come skate here. Someone That's said to me the other day, I always loved his signs up there. Just like two, he's a wordy guy, right? He's a, he's, he's an author. He'd have these signs with like 200 words and expect, I'd be like, Bill, people aren't going to read those signs. Um, so just, you know, he's got very, he's, it's very personalized to him. And over the years, as the community has gotten more involved, evolved, it's become more systematic. We've got signs with 20 words instead of 200. Um, we also used to question, like, he's like, I'm going to go buy more hoses. We're like, who's buying more hoses? You're buying more hoses. Over the years, I don't know how much money he has um, put into the rink. Um, the last thing he one of the last things he did was we need a Zamboni and someone spoke up and said, okay, then do a GoFundMe bill. You really don't need to pay these thousands of dollars. He's, he's like, I'll do it. I'm, I'm happy to do it. I'll just do it. And the neighborhood started really um, pitching in and being like, no, we want to play too. We want to do this ice thing. And all of this was done by a man who has never had a cell phone. He does not know how to use Facebook. He did this all with personal connection, with creating relationships with people. And I just have to say, this is a very happy and enthusiastic man. And he gets so much joy out of simply going up there in the afternoon and seeing the 45 kids and parents and teenagers up there. And I just want to so thank much, you MC. all for um, considering um, possibly honoring him in this way. He doesn't know this yet. Right. Thank you very much for those words. I and really I appreciate leave, it. Feel free to ask questions. Thank you, MC. Uh, okay. I think that means that, Tom, you can probably put yourself on mute and turn it back up so you guys can hear the rest of the presentation. John, I believe we do have Elizabeth Erickson here as well. No. Yep, we also have Elizabeth. We want to introduce Elizabeth. Elizabeth was the former open spaces manager for the city. She lives in the neighborhood. Um, and Elizabeth would like to say a few words as well. Hello, Park Board. It's so great to see all of your faces. Um, so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to this request. I've spent the past 12 years or so living within walking distance of Pineview Park, which is essentially my kids' entire childhood. They're now 11 and 13. <clears throat> and we have spent countless hours at the Pineview Rink. They learned to skate there with the help of some chairs, also some coaching from Coach Patty at the Learn to Skate program. But they just they, they have spent so many hours there just trying to, to learn to skate as, as they were younger toddlers. They've celebrated friends' birthday parties there um, over the years. I love that MC mentioned the um, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day skates and New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Those have just always been a, a tradition for us when we're in town where we'll uh, pack up hot cocoa and snacks and meet friends over there. Just a time to get out. And Bill and his crew have always worked tirelessly to make sure those holidays, the rink was just in tip top shape for those opportunities. And now that my kids are teens or tweens, it means that they can now walk over to the rink by themselves and meet friends over there. My 11 year old just trucks over for pickup hockey and they'll be there for hours. I mean, we'll wander over to just make sure he's still alive because he just won't come home for hours. And, you know, my daughter can meet her friends there. And so it just provides this independence that they wouldn't have otherwise, where they can just have a place to go to gather. It's safe, it's clean, it's wholesome fun, and they're recreating outside. And, and I just can't think of a more fitting way to honor Bill's tireless efforts over the years to make this rink what it's meant to our, our neighborhood and just our larger community. So thank you everyone for the opportunity to add my two cents and uh, it's really great to see all of you. Thanks Elizabeth and uh, Morgan, you may have some additional comments, but it's important to note um, on that the referral is for the parks board to move this along to city council. City council would make the ultimate decision about the renaming. Um, 
but uh, obviously uh, a referral from the park board would mean an awful lot. Um, so before we take any public comments, what I'd like to do is uh, see if we can get a motion on the floor uh, for discussion. Okay, this is Margie. I move that the board recommends to Missoula City Council to approve officially naming the ice rink in Pineby Park to the Bill Beavis Ice Rink. And then following that approval that the board, uh, that the uh, Friends of Missoula, that they dedicate to the volunteers and, and put a sign of recognition at the ice rink also. Thank you, Margie. Is there a second? This is Wendy, I'll second. Thank you, Wendy. Any discussion from members of the board? Do we have any public comments? No public comment. Hearing no further discussion, we'll open up for a roll call vote, please. John? Aye. Sonia? Aye. Wendy? Aye. Danny? Aye. Margie? Aye. Aaron? Yes. Motion passed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, MC and Elizabeth, for your comments. Um, this is a wonder, this will be a wonderful, wonderful surprise. Um, so we're going to move on now to action item 2.2, the current Center for Recreation and Creativity recommendation. I'm going to turn the floor over to Donna and Ryan for that. Donna, I believe you're muted. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, John and Park Board members. I want to share with you that uh, with me today are members of the Friends of a Community Center for Missoula and also Kent Means from MacArthur Means and Wells. I'm going to uh, go through a presentation uh, outlining uh, the immense amount of public process, the design and uh, narrative that goes with that. And we are um, asking you today to approve it. So I'm going to um, go ahead and I'll let you uh, stop me. And I cannot see all of you. So you'll have to give a shout out if you would. But. So current Center for Recreation and Creativity. This is a conceptual plan and we're requesting council or park boards consideration of adopting the plan as recommended by the working group and then advancing the same onto the city council and asking that they too adopt the plan. I'm gonna to present to you today a brief history on how we got here today, the benefits and why we need a community center, what the public process included, what a conceptual design is and what this particular conceptual design uh, is composed of and looks like. A very brief um, visit to a performer or business plan and cost considerations that went into it. The specific working group recommendations and then again uh, requesting park board action. One thing I wanna remind everybody today is we are not asking for any appropriation of any kind for construction for design, for uh, operating budget, we're purely asking for your adoption of the conceptual plan. So public support, what's the history on uh, a community center for Missoula or more specifically current center for recreation and creativity? Well, in 2000, we were all getting ramped up for the new millennium. And so I'll take you back uh, 22 years. And there was a very expansive, extensive public process hosted by a number of corporations in our community and hosted at the University of Montana where hundreds of individuals participated. And there were um, three major goals that came out of that. A central park at the fairgrounds, a Missoula area endowment and a community center for Missoula. In 2003, we adopted the McCormick Park Master Site Plan, setting aside a specific footprint for a future community center. And that too included significant public process. 
more more recently or very recently is the 2015 it, the community center concept just continues to gain traction. Also note that it was in the 2004 uh, urban area comprehensive plan for parks and recreation. Very recently, uh, this, the uh, center is in the 2020 climate ready Missoula plan under resiliency, providing places for people to remain active and uh, social in spite of smoke and other weather. And also in the city of Missoula, city council mayor strategic priorities. And in the strategic priorities, we talk specifically about two centers, the one we have at the Lowell uh, Neighborhood uh, and Westside Park uh, Center, which is a very neighborhood based center. And then the current center for recreation and creativity, which is a community based center where a facility would be dedicated year round 360 plus days a year 15 hours a day to recreation and cultural activities in 2021 uh, we funded an effort through impact fees to dive a little bit deeper into exactly what needs what is the program for a community center and what park board did in um, the spring of 2021 is they approved a public process for us to engage in uh, and, and allowing us to go forward uh, with our contract with MMW, uh, which is formally approved by the city council, and also um, acknowledging uh, that we would be coming back with a proposal. So the proposed conceptual design expands upon the existing current aquatic center. In that center, the, the facility I'm sitting in today and where we typically have these meetings was funded um, in, uh, and opened in 2006. It was funded by general obligation bonds and tax increment financing and a, a handful of other smaller uh, amounts. But it's important to recognize that current technically was phase one of a future community center, which today we are talking about as current center for recreation and um, creativity. We have been doing additional planning throughout. In 2018, we completed a statistically valid uh, public opinion poll. We did ask specific questions within the PROST, Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Trails plan about a community center. And 66% of respondents um, said multi-generational -gener populations is who needs to be served that the place should be for meetings, gatherings, small events, that we want to prioritize fitness and wellness, and we need places for dance performance and places to watch performances. In the 20 to 23 um, city strategic plan, we have talked about uh, designing, creating programs, facilities, and spaces that promote equity, where all are welcome and, um, and belong and are able to uh, fully engage. We want to uh, define disparities in our community, identify solutions, advance social, economic, and racial equity. We want to create a pro-equity policy agenda, which we've been doing around jobs, climate, environment, housing, health, behavioral health, justice system. And we want to create a multi-purpose Missoula Community Center centrally located within McCormick Park that serves the multi-generational year-round uh, needs and is affordable for all. The uh, JEDI resolution, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, further promoted uh, the concept of providing places and spaces for all. The benefits, the why. So when we talk about uh, the benefits of current Center for Recreation and Creativity, what came out of the public process that we've been engaged in now for over 20 years is we want to meet communities' needs for families, youth, and aging adults. We're looking for year-round indoor recreation. In case some of our uh, board members are not um, yet aware, we do no longer have access to city life, and we re um, regularly uh, go without uh, meeting the demands of uh, our residents for indoor recreation in the winter and during the smoke season. We need a place for fitness, dance, performance, meetings, gatherings, places to play and for community celebrations. We're looking uh, at the community center as a resource for enhanced mental and physical health. 
We are um, an important thing that came out of the planning process was providing a resource hub so that residents of Missoula can find not only government provided um, opportunities uh, for resource access, but also Missoula has an immense number of nonprofits who are super excited about having a centralized resource center where they can meet uh, with residents to share what's available at the food bank, Missoula Aging Services, Summit Independent Living, and the list goes on and on and on. And also the community was very clear, we want a model for sustainable and equitable design. Health equity and inclusion. Uh, we wanna improve health equity by providing spaces for community health and intervention strategies. We look, we're looking to build and sustain uh, physical and mental health and wellness. We know that when we bring people together, connect people of all backgrounds, we have a stronger, more vibrant, more kind, more respectful community and a healthier community in every way. Regarding sustainability and climate resiliency, we're looking to offer a facility that offers indoor year round respite from climate and weather. With Missoula's um, up and down climate, I will call it, uh, we are seeing extended smoke seasons, extended seasons of ice, and we've always dealt with a long dark season. We want a place where we can enjoy the kinds of things we do as a community at Bonner Park when it's full force and you're at the uh, International Choral Festival or one of the band concerts and the, and the playground is running and the sport courts are busy and the fields are busy. That's the kind of thing we imagine indoors and that it includes cultural and uh, active recreation activities. We, again, a model for sustainability and there's a lot of discussion and um, we had special uh, stakeholder uh, work sessions with our partners in sustainability and a lot of wonderful um, ideas there about how do we create clean air, uh, create great spaces and um, are sensitive to our environment. Building community, the facility needs to be welcome, accessible, inclusive. It needs to be a place for all, multi-generational, once again, all ages under one roof, yet providing spaces within that roof where a different interest could meet, or I could play games or have a conversation with an individual privately and yet be part of the bigger community. Wide variety of activities and interests need to be met. And we are really focused on in working with residents and neighborhoods. We want to complement existing services. There is no interest in repeating what's being done elsewhere. And in fact, what Parks and Recreation has done, uh, at least in my entire time with the department, which is now over 30 years, is we partner with other organizations, nonprofits, and private business. And what you'll often find at Parks and Recreation is this is where uh, individuals first try an activity and then they eventually become members of other organizations or um, nonprofits or take um, some of their business to uh, the private sector. So we wanna build lifelong participants and audiences. We want to um, introduce folks to classes and arts and other opportunities that they may not uh, regularly be able to enjoy or know that it's available to them. I mentioned and talked about not duplicating services. And again, we wanna be a primary connection point to numerous community services. Again, a resource hub for the entire community. So what did public process look like? We had uh, two major phases of the public process, an early one in order to gather ideas around programming and to develop guiding principles uh, for design. And then we had a second phase later on uh, after an initial design to gain the public's feedback on whether or not our design team listened. And uh, the working group was incredibly helpful in with us uh, outreach. Uh, listening to the community, reviewing designs, asking hard critical questions. Uh, we worked with uh, steering members from our friends group. We invited in a number of technical experts. I already talked about sustainability. We also talked to the many regulatory agencies and uh, in neighborhood residents, as well as potential users. We had a number of community open houses. We used Engage Missoula, which gathered a significant amount of data. And then um, Ashley, our 
um, D, our Jedi coordinator, uh, led our charge on targeted outreach, meeting with teen groups, uh, farmers market, going to uh, events hosted by All Nations Health Center. Uh, we met with um, LGBTQ communities and uh, many, many more uh, for very targeted outreach. We also attended a number of public events uh, in uh, neighborhoods where folks often do not have the time because they're busy juggling uh, multiple jobs and uh, family demands. So the vision of flexible multi-use space to support healthy lifestyles in an equitable multi-generational and inclusive atmosphere. Space for inclusive recreational and social programs for all ages, incomes, and abilities, connecting people of all backgrounds, a safe year-round environment. Guiding principles, these were by the working group, and I, I just felt that they were very powerful. Missoula is a diverse community, and the community center should reflect the diversity. Keep in mind that guiding principles are, are shared, we believe statements, and the working group worked very hard at these and reviewed them each time they met. Welcome all generations, ethnicities, cultures, races, gender, sexual identities, accessible to people of all abilities, especially individuals with disabilities, respectful of the existing community services, amenities, and to work with and to integrate with them. Fixed structures that restrict use or accessibility I need to be um, watched carefully because we wanna make sure that all facilities to the extent possible are fully accessible and have multiple uses, uh, just like we try to do in our park system. Affordable to all in terms of not only accessing, but getting the facility built. We wanna respect the planet and be a model for climate change, an opportunity for education. All design should be very intentional and meet the needs of the many, many groups who are interested, uh, whether it's a social gathering, a sport, a performance, or uh, educational opportunity, or uh, all of our youth camps. The aesthetic should combine organic materials, uh, be a very sensitive acoustically, uh, and that means, is it quiet enough so I can hear myself think and have a conversation? And does it work to play music and have a celebration? We want to use, um, have efficient use of space. And we uh, have gone around and around on how to make a facility welcoming to all. The facility should be modest rather than opulent and enduring rather than trendy. It should be adaptable. It should be able to swing with trends and meet community's needs, whether it's a pandemic or a major celebration. Community outreach themes were consistent uh, from our general community to our targeted outreach. Uh, some of the things that uh, show up obviously are indoor, dance, culture, uh, programs for BIPOC communities, affordability, uh, uh, performance, uh, anti-bias, um, uh, having a kitchen, having basically what you're going to see is programs for everybody uh, and everybody welcome. Once we came back and we asked folks, how did the design look to you? 84% of respondents said the project honors the project's vision. 79% said that the project honors the guiding principles. Questions and concerns that uh, came to the top. Uh, make sure that the uh, facility is accessible by all including indiv individuals with disabilities. I uh, make sure that all the entry points, the access, not just inside the building, but around the building and all floors and offices are accessible. Um, make sure that the facility is safe and then accessible in every way. So SEPTEC, crime prevention through environmental design, sight lines, uh, how we maintain and operate a facility, and then make sure that we can all access a facility. So the conceptual design, uh, again, Kent is here for specific questions, but really important about the location. Uh, the location would be up against the railroad tracks and uh, all connected to the current aquatic center, uh, designed with a new entrance. And so it speaks to the Clark Fork River and the rest of the park. There are multiple planned future connections to the park for pedestrian accessibility. There are future planned parking locations, uh, including over at 100 Hickory. We already um, have incredible walkability, bikeability. We already have routes and pullouts for mountain line bus on site. So super excited about the location, not only from a uh, mode 
uh, multimodal access, but also very, very walkable and serving a larger neighborhood that is um, probably one of the most diverse socioeconomically and every other way in our community. So on this slide, you have the Silver's Lagoon over to the left, the existing aquatic center. Uh, the lobby of the existing aquatic center would become the future resource center, the hub. Uh, we would have a multi-use gym auditorium uh, type facility, a community ballroom, social dance that can be both larger and smaller, uh, a multi-form black box and multiple uh, classrooms. One of the things we're super excited about also is our child care center. We can store all of our camp equipment. Kids can quickly come inside during a storm. We can deploy all of our camps out of here. So you know what that looks like, a facility for teens and tweens and a facility for um, aging adults and seniors. This is a second floor. It would include a walking track, additional meeting rooms, classrooms, and uh, mechanical, of course. Uh, this would be looking at it from the river side and uh, kind of from downtown uh, looking across towards Southgate Mall, if you will. Uh, what a cool thing. I can actually, as a member of the public, uh, not necessarily have to go to a restaurant or a hotel, but get a bird's eye view into the canopy of trees in the Clark Fork River on an upper story patio uh, and have access to all of these wonderful um, opportunities. The theme of currents would continue. We're along the river. Uh, Currents Aquatic Center has ripples and headwaters. This would be the new uh, channel going through the facility uh, with naming and feel and theme, uh, rooms being the eddies along the river, uh, the convergence of uh, all things that are absolutely wonderful about Missoula. This is a better uh, pictorial of what you might look like. The architecture and design is very much uh, meant to complement and go with currents. A lot of uh, daylight, a lot of organic and warm colors, uh, solar arrays to help with um, uh, utilities, and then uh, different entries uh, that we would use on a regular basis. Our primary entrance would be here. Our camp and evening performance entrances would be back um, off of the park and uh, just allow for a lot of flexibility throughout the entire facility. This gets you more of a street level view of what drop off might look like. Uh, we're looking at some sort of a uh, cultural walk or uh, ambiance here. We want the out, out um, exterior to be able to host food trucks and events as well as the interior. Again, uh, looking uh, from a slightly different angle, just some of the feel uh, of the exterior and, and gathering spaces. I can't tell you how many times we have huge groups of school kids come and they fill up the lobby. And in the summer, we like to do these activities outdoors. This would be a view of the lobby, uh, again, looking at SEPTED principles uh, for safety, but also how exciting to come into a facility and see people of all ages and backgrounds engaging in community and engaging in each other and giving us an opportunity to see an active facility full of life and energy and residents um, getting to know each other. Uh, Multi-use, uh, so two basketball courts, multiple volleyball, pickleball. We could play futsal on these facilities and adaptive sports. It's really a facility designed for participation where all people can come together and play. And I got to tell you the difference between going to an individual elementary or middle school gym for one game a night and then having to leave because there's not room compared to having multi-sport courts going on simultaneously while other people are swimming, engaged in dance and watching a performance. There's an energy that you simply cannot repeat anywhere else but in a facility like this. This would be a view from the riverside. Uh, imagine um, just off your slide here is one of our um, secondary river access sites and one of our more popular uh, takeout sites along the river an overlook onto it and the ability for the um, performance and dance spaces to actually look out onto or even open up onto the river. We did look, take a look at costs. And with every new major facility, uh, Parks and Recreation likes to go into them eyes wide open. 
We have not settled on any final. This is a projection uh, looking out into 2024 of, and it does consider the incredible inflation we've been through this year. So I have to be um, very clear. I would absolutely expect and hope that these numbers would actually be lower two years from now. At least that's what we experienced after the 2008 to 2010 significant recession. And uh, so we're, we think we will be biding some time and uh, looking at many, many ways. So what a plan does for us is we understand what cost to operate will likely be, we understand what cost to construct would likely be inflated already. Keep in mind, there's been significant inflation this year. And then uh, we looked at very specific general operating assumptions, and I'm gonna to touch on the major ones. We did look at all direct and indirect expenses, full expenses. We looked at uh, provision of services as well as significant number of rentals and provision of services by others. We looked at drawing from a secondary service area or about a 16 minute drive to the facility and believe it'll be a clear draw for uh, residents of those areas. Uh, and especially residents within a mile and a half radius for walk and bike. We expect a very high level of programming. I would expect this to be very much like Fort Missoula has been, uh, build it and they will come. Uh, we have seen that on steroids and exponentially out of Fort Missoula. There are passive use areas in the facility that are accessible, the resource center, the lobbies, some of the meeting spaces, services for teens and aging adults that would be at no cost, uh, all of the outer areas. Um, rental rates would be very comparable to existing facilities that are reservable in our community. And at this time we have no cardio or uh, weight equipment in there. And that would be about a hundred thousand dollar wag. But again, we're not trying to repeat what others are doing. The working group uh, pressed us hard on um, operating. They wanted to make sure that the facility was fully accessible. So the plans would need to include a very robust scholarship program. And we positioned the CCRC kind of in between where we're at and cost recovery at Splash and Currents today and Fort Missoula Regional Park, recognizing that the programs provided at Splash and Currents do require a fee or some sort of scholarship pass to enter. And it's very difficult. It's the reason we built the spray decks. And note the spray decks are completely um, subsidized by um, tax dollars and park district. But uh, people pay to go to Splash and Currents. We have a cost recovery rate of about 86%. At Fort Missoula, we have an overall cost recovery rate of about 38%. People can visit that park anytime, uh, you know, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., all open hours, 365 days a year. And so there's a cost recovery for special services for reservations and rentals. We think current center for recreation and creativity will likely fall somewhere in between that. And this is just a projection, a snapshot in time, envisioning two years from now and what the design might um, include as presented here today. We wanted to assure you, uh, we would not be the only, nor would we be the first in Montana. And I have to tell you, I came from, um, I came from North Dakota in 1991. I managed a community center there. I've worked in multiple community centers. They do become hubs of the community. They become the active hubs of the community. And it is the one major amenity that I feel we are still so short in offering our community. Specific working group recommendations. The recommendation is that the design is provided by MacArthur uh, by MMW Architects reflects the needs and values of the Missoula residents. It works well and within the natural and built environment, the site. It will have clean indoor air, use sustainable practices and materials, build a more resilient and inclusive Missoula. The working group's recommendations um, has the potential to host a wide variety of programs and services transform how the needs of Missoula residents are met, especially for communities that have been left out in the past. It should be a place to celebrate community and actively grow together a healthy environment where all are engaged. We'll facilitate recreation, creativity, renewal, and respite. And the working group requests 
that the city and friends of the community center mitigate as much of the cost as they possibly can through alternative funding when possible or through shared funding. So the motion before the board today is that we request that the park board consider adopting, approving as presented to you by the working group, me being the spokesperson for the working group, with or without amendments and recommend the same for the Missoula City Council, adopting this conceptual master site plan for current center for recreation and creativity, and that the um, passing on to the council, what it does for us is it allows us to continue additional outreach and education to further develop the details around program, further develop partnerships. It also provides us the information and support necessary to seek additional funding. It, it sets us up wonderfully for grants and uh, park board members that have been with us for some time have seen this happen or come to fruition over and over again, where we have a, a well-supported community vision that does find its way to donations, grants, and other funding. What the adoption does not do is it does not adopt the costs. It does not adopt a way of covering those costs, nor does it adopt future operations costs or fee structures. So I just want to be clear. What we are asking you to adopt today is a schematic master plan for the current center for recreation and creativity. And with that, I would be delighted to take any questions and uh, ask, um, and I, one thing, uh, Chairman, that I do ask is we give the opportunity for the friends uh, to also speak to you uh, before we finish our presentation. Sure. Um, are there any clarifying questions for Donna? I have one, John. Um, <clears throat> when you say you're not going to repeat other things that are offered, um, so like there's an art center downtown, you wouldn't have one in the community center? Or what? how are you going to decide what's repeating and what's not? We would work very closely. Um, so we've received those questions. How is this different than the food bank and community center, uh, Zootown Arts uh, Community Center? Um, Missoula Public Library with um, all the amenities. And so Zootown Arts is very so focused on, on the arts and the programs that they're offering do not need to be repeated here um, unless we're doing those things collaboratively. Same with programs for the library. I think of that as our intellectual community center. Doesn't mean you're not active, it can't be social. And uh, same conversations with uh, the food bank. This is an active center for physical engagement. It's a hub where those uh, nonprofits are not currently featured. And the way we do that, Sonia, is by communicating and partnering. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Sonia. Any other questions for Donna? Um, yeah, I had one. Uh, Donna, I don't think it was mentioned of how many jobs or um, employment opportunities would come about with this community center as well. I don't know if you have an estimate of what that could potentially mean for future employment. Um, we have done some of that as it uh, relates to long-term employment. And I can also get you uh, uh, roughly related on construction. I do not have that at my fingertips right now, Aaron, but happy to bring that forward. Um, Ryan might be able to look up the number of FTEs projected for the operating the facility as we talk and get that to you. And uh, as a point of clarification, um, just from my working with the, the friends group, I know that uh, to address both Sonia and Aaron's questions, the friends group is, is really being strategic right now and in, in not labeling this another community center as much as um, labeling this a, a center for creativity and recreation. You know, it's, um, they're, they're working hard from a program perspective to think of this differently. And what we're talking about today, correct me if I'm wrong, Donna, is the conceptual plan itself, which does uh, include some programming elements in terms of how you assign space, but we're not looking to approve or recommend anything to do with programming at this point. This is an early phase discussion and we're talking about a conceptual plan. Correct. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions for Donna, I would like to invite the friends group to say a few words. 
And if we could limit it to three minutes so we could get public comment and move forward, that'd be great. I saw Michael's sweet hand come up first. So we'll start with yeah. Michael. Yeah, I'll be real brief. Um, just one one thing with uh, um, this center is also part of the downtown master plan and the master planning process went, you know, completed a couple of years ago. And so it, it is a component of that master plan. And then, you know, I think to feed off of John's comment, um, you know, we're creating an, uh, an opportunity space. And, you know, I, I look at, um, you know, the library versus private bookstores or other things, you know, it, it creates, the library is there to create a audience and a lifelong commitment to reading. You know, I look at the, the Center for Recreation and Creativity as, as something similar it's to introduce and engage people so that they make a, a lifelong commitment to fitness and wellness. And our, our perspective, at least my perspective as a friends group is, we wanna go beyond where the current arts community is and where the current recreation community is, Missoula. We want to build audience. We want to make everybody successful. So I don't look at it as competition, but as, as complementary efforts and and really uh, strengthen the future of Missoula. So that's all the comments I have. Thank you, Michael. Is there anyone else from the Friends Group? Amy has her hand up. Hi, I'm Amy Ragsdale, and I've been um, collaborating with um, Donna at Parks and Rec and all the folks there, and Mike, and uh, know that the small group of friends for almost 10 years now. And I'm just quickly, my background is in contemporary modern dance. I taught uh, in the program at the university for you know 20 years. I ran the program there for 12 years. I've run two contemporary dance uh, companies here in Missoula, one under the auspices of the university and then one off campus. So um, I have extensive experience <laughs> with the struggles and challenges of trying to find places to perform in Missoula for a company, for a local company, not a big touring company. Um, that is both an intimate house and, uh, you know, really a fully outfitted uh, place. But I'm not actually wanting to talk about that, but I'll be happy to answer questions <laughs> if you have them. Um, rather, I'd like to talk about some other things that I've come, have come to be really important to me about this space. And one of them has to do with that question of accessibility and not only for physical accessibility, but financial accessibility, affordability. And, um, you know, I was a UN professor, so I was lucky. I could afford to enroll my two kids in private dance studios and private soccer clubs and guitar lessons and private gymnastics. Um, I also had the kind of job that gave me the kind of flexibility to transport them all over the place, all over town every day. And I actually one year looked into that and realized I was spending three hours a day transporting my kids to extracurricular activities on top of my full-time job. But luckily I had that kind of flexibility and um, not everybody has those things. And I was really, this really was brought to the fore for me when I was talking to a friend recently who's um, a coach for Mountain Home, the nonprofit that supports single new mothers and trying to help them get on their feet. And she was talking about the mother she was coaching who was really struggling because she has had a hard time keeping a job because she has two kids and one of them, her son uh, has hyperactivity disorder. The result being that the school was continually calling her and saying, hey, he's disrupting the class. You have to come pick him up. And she didn't have the kinds of jobs that allowed her to just leave, pick up her son and then be home for the rest of the day. Um, the result being that she's had a hard time keeping a job. Um, likewise, she doesn't have the resources for transportation and of course the resources to enroll her kids in lots of private uh, kind of clubs and studios. And so here she is cooped up in her apartment with a hyperactive son and daughter and imagine if she had the possibility of bringing them to a place where they could both be engaged in activities, she could get there by a bus, one place, and God forbid, I think we've probably all been there, she might have a little time for herself. Like maybe she could go walk around a track or <laughs> go swimming or 
have a cup of coffee, you know, while they're, you know, healthfully and safely engaged. So I think it's um, obligatory for us to think about those people in this town and how to provide this kind of service for them. The other piece, um, which comes partly from my uh, experience of trying to build an audience for modern dance here for 25 years, um, I'm so excited by the idea of the synergy of having all these different kinds of activities in one place and the possibility then of someone discovering something that they would not be drawn to because it hasn't been a part of their cultural background. So I struggled for years to figure out how to get people to come to a theater when going to a theater is just not something they or their families ever did. Here's an opportunity for somebody who's gonna come uh, because they wanna play pickleball and they're gonna see that there's a music jam or there's a contra dance or that mountain home mother, you know, maybe her son would really like hip hop or hula hooping or, you know, God knows whatever they could find, you know? So it's also provides that kind of opportunity, which all the siloed uh, spaces that currently exist do not. Um, the, the, the second point that I guess has made this feel more urgent for me is that um, as we're all well aware, um, nationally, uh, certainly, we are discovering that we're strangers to each other. And I have for years thought about this question of how do we meet people who are unlike ourselves? And certainly we're seeing this in our local communities as well. And I think we're especially quick, and I guess I'll speak for myself, <laughs> to jump to assumptions about who people are now and what their values might be and, um, and label them awfully quickly. And I think they're, a center like this that offers you a way to be active while meeting other people offers the opportunity to meet someone first through signing up for a pickleball workshop or because you're both uh, watching your kids and the child drop off or you're, um, you know, accompanying your elderly parent in their class for, you know, stretch class for people with Alzheimer's. What a way to meet people, you know, and, and start to get to know somebody through that kind of channel rather than just like, oh, well, they look like they're this kind of a person, not my type. So that seems super important to me. The last thing I would say quickly is that, you know, to that initial question, Sonia, about the Zach, um, for example, we have tremendous respect for Kia who's running the ZAC and the people who've developed the library and super excited to be a facility that could complement them, that could perhaps offer them spaces as their program grows and they run out of their own space. Um, as Donna said, they're an art center, but they're specifically a visual art center and music. And when we talked to Kia, one of the things we discovered was that musicians, and we heard this through all these stakeholder groups, musicians need places to practice and that's something, for example, that while Zach is also music oriented, they can't provide. They have places for their camps, but they don't have places for community musicians. So we've been looking hard at this question of duplication. And what I think is that while spaces exist that will also be in the center, none of them, including the center, are gonna fulfill the demand. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? There's no other public comment. Hi, this is Ryan Applegate. Um, just wanted to respond to the question of um, job creation in relation to the um, pro forma study that was done in, in conjunction with the conceptual plan. Um, and that is um, you know, based on the conceptual current conceptual design around uh, nine additional FTEs and full-time staff and then around 15 additional FTEs and uh, part-time staff for, for the ongoing uh, nature of operations. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. All right, seeing no additional public comment, uh, we've had the presentation and now I would entertain a motion. Uh, 
Um, can, I get, can I make one more comment? Um, Don, I, I got the email from, from Bob Giordano, the director of MIST and uh, Free Cycles. Um, and it, would this be an appropriate time just to touch on a few details of that? Yeah, he just suggested one very minor edit, um, which I'll just um, go over. The, it says on that conceptual site plan diagram, uh, future traffic light at Orange and Craig. He says he's currently on a city committee that is bringing forward a roundabout policy this year. Roundabouts, when correctly designed, can reduce injuries to all users by 95%. Uh, and he just asks for one minor um, edit to change future traffic light to future intersection improvement or something along those lines, um, just to take into consideration that they're still advocating for um, a safer uh, system over there. And he understands that that's not necessarily, it's a done deal, but, um, and they're very well, it could be a traffic light, but just to keep it open-ended at this point. Thanks. Is there a staff response to that? Um, what we, so what we did include in the design is what is in the plans. Um, we, we don't have the authority to plan the streets with this project. So it really would be a label name. Um, uh, we will note that in the, um, in the records. And I guess it's up, up to park board if you want us to direct um, and have all the labels named on all of the documents to change that. I don't think it changes what Bob is trying to achieve. And there's probably other avenues to do that that are gonna be honestly more effective than the community or the current Center for Recreation and Creativity Conceptual Design. Follow up on that, Donna. Um, <clears throat> since the conceptual design uh, is for the building, but includes the outlying potential for future development of parking and other things, how hard would it be to replace the label on the conceptual plan from light to intersection improvement? Um, it's not that difficult. Um, we can do it. it. It's all I'm saying is it's not going to be very impactful to what he's trying to achieve. There's other ways that we could work with Bob that are probably more helpful, but if changing a label um, does anything, that's fine. I really were just approving the building and the conceptual site plan was to show how well it works with walkability. What is the, um, we don't have a motion on the, the floor yet, but what would be the, the desire of board members in terms of this particular edit? If it's not a big hassle, I would like to see the edit because I really do appreciate what he's saying and I know staff does too. So if it's not a big problem, then I totally appreciate Donna your comments about how to work with Bob and I have faith that we will do that, but it just seems like if we can make that edit, I'd rather see it. I feel the same way. Any other comments from any other board members on that? Okay, so we still do not have a motion on the floor, but we do have an edit. Um, and I would entertain a motion to include the edit or not include the edit or. So this is Wendy and I make the motion uh, to adopt with the edit regarding the intersection. Um, that we move to adopt the conceptual master plan for the current Center for Recreation and Creativity as we met, recommended by the uh, working group and to further direct staff to advance the CCRC conceptual plan to the city council with the park board's recommendation. Thank you, Wendy. Is there a second? This is Margie, I second the motion. Thank you, Margie. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, do we have any public comment on the motion? There's no public comment. Then I will ask for a roll call vote, please. John? Aye. Sonia? Aye. Wendy? Aye. Danny? Aye. Margie? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Motion passes.
Congratulations. I know this has been a lot of years of work and effort. Thanks to the Friends Group. Thanks, Donna. John, if I may, could just a shout out to Kent Means of MMW Architects, Brooke Hanley of NAC Architecture Firm, and then to uh, the Friends, uh, Mike and Amy and Tarn um, have been absolutely fabulous and working hundreds and hundreds of hours. Our architects were great listeners and also shout out to Ryan and Ashley and Becky for all their work on staffing this project. So thank you so much to the park board for all your support. This is a huge one. Uh, it was a millennial top three. Uh, we hope to see it happen one day soon. Awesome, thank you. All right, we have about 45 minutes left. We have one more action item. It's an important action item. Uh, item 2.3, Bluebird Preserve Recreation and Special Resource Management Plan. Uh, Jeff, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you for this. Thank you, John, and I will attempt to be very quick here. I understand we have a lot of um, agenda items still to go. So, um, the Conservation Lands Program uh, has been moving through the uh, planning process with CLAC for the Bluebird Preserve property, um, and we have developed a draft uh, recreation and special resource management plan to present to you today. This was discussed and unanimously approved at CLAC. Uh, the draft version was unanimously approved at CLAC last night. I'm gonna go through very brief site orientation, a few key highlights, um, and then the fact that uh, how, how long we're asking for a public comment to be designated, public comment period to be designated for. So uh, for to orient everybody to the Bluebird property, um, and you can see this map here, uh, the Bluebird property bounds are shown in green to orient everybody. Uh, here is Grant Creek. Here's Interstate 90. And so uh, this, this property that was acquired by the city in 2019, uh, it lies just north of the interchange um, at Grant Creek Road. Um, additionally, you, oh, excuse me, adjacent to that, you can see that there is a 300 acre uh, conservation easement property that's owned and managed by Republic Services. And we have a standing trails easement for, uh, to allow public access onto that property with restrictions that Republic Services um, issues. And so the bounds of this planning area includes both a very small uh, public access easement to get people onto the Bluebird property, the Bluebird property itself, and the Republic Services Conservation Easement. So I'm just gonna highlight a few things. Uh, remember that this is a recreation and special resource management plan. So we're going to highlight uh, proposed recreational developments, their associated infrastructure goals, objectives, but also key uh, natural resource priorities and management strategies for this site in particular. All other uh, resource management would be consistent with the 2010 Conservation Lands Management Plan. So, Three key uh, natural resource priorities on this property. One being, this is one of the two known Missoula flocks populations that we have on city owned lands. Um, it's one of only three uh, known Missoula flocks populations anywhere in the valley. And so we are working to both conserve, protect and restore uh, disturbed areas that either currently have Missoula flocks or previously had Missoula flocks. Um, we also some have some intact rough fescue grasslands, and this will be important relative to the next statement. Um, and so working to protect those intact uh, habitat and plant communities would be very key. We also, unfortunately, have a very large suite of non-native species, non-native plant species on the property. And so we actually developed um, an integrated vegetation management plan that, that identifies goals and objectives for integrated pet, uh, vegetation management and uh, tackling those invasive species issues over time. Uh, I'm gonna just go through this and show you maps that will make a lot more sense, but there's a lot of content talking about allowed use restrictions, um, seasonal use, both you know, on the public services property, um, uh, the types of infrastructure that we're proposing. We can see all that maps, so we're gonna review it very quickly there. Here you can see the proposed trails plan uh, for the plan area. Um, and to orient everybody again, here's Grant Creek Road. 
this is the existing Snowball Overflow parking lot. So it's a very large gravel parking lot on the east side of Grand Creek Road as you head up. The access easement is at the north end of that parking lot. There would be a connector trail connecting you to an existing roadbed, which runs this way, a loop trail option, as well as a trail to an overlook um, up here. So there's a high point on the ridge to get to give people uh, a view of Grant Creek and the broader valley. Um, I did wanna highlight the fact that we are proposing that all trails with one exception are open to pedestrians and equestrians only and not bicycles. And that is because uh, under the conservation easement on the Republic Services property, it specifically prohibits mechanized travel, which includes bicycles. And so therefore uh, we are proposing that all trails are open to pedestrians and equestrians with the exception of the overlook trail here I'm showing in the corridor. That is because of the uh, potential for higher levels of congestion to get to the overlook and um, uh, grades getting up there on this side. We have proposed infrastructure, including multiple um, interpretation sign locations. Uh, you can see trailhead uh, sort of infrastructure parking area here. Interpretation sign, there's an old excavator on site, which was used to actually initially grade the property, um, talking about how the property actually came into city hands, uh, and sort of the uh, legacy of conservation there. Um, talking about flocks interpretation or uh, protection and restoration as well as uh, navigational signage, fencing, those types of things. And then uh, one last thing, and this is pretty exciting. So here's the trailhead location. In addition to this, I have verbal um, uh, support from the city's public works department and their streets division to examine the feasibility of a protected uh, pedestrian crossing on Grant Creek Road at the north end of this existing sidewalk right at Stonebridge. And so, um, this uh, trailhead, you know, is going to serve both the Bluebird property, but currently there's no uh, established trailhead for the Grant Creek Trail. And so with a protected crossing, individuals could park at this trailhead, cross the road and access the Grant Creek Trail. Vice versa, they could access from one of the adjacent neighborhoods, come down the Grant Creek Trail, cross the road safely and access uh, this plan area. So we're quite excited about that. I don't know the full scope, they would have to go through um, sort of an infrastructure planning process uh, once we have the commitment moving forward. Um, with that, we are asking that the Parks Board uh, designates a one month public comment period. Prior to this point, we have not um, done any broad outreach to the community except for targeted communications with particular user groups like the Grant Creek Trails Association, for example. And so designating a one month public, public comment period should allow us time to um, uh, acquire as much public feedback as we can so that we can revise the plan moving forward. Thank you. And Jeff, for clarification, yeah. if we did approve that one month um, comment period, then there would be revisions made to the document that would go back to CLAC. They would then make their revisions at us and then it would come back to Parks Board. Is that correct? That is correct, John. Okay, thank you. This is really, um, asking the public how they feel about the plan and if they would uh, like to see any requested changes or edits. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions for uh, Jeff? Jeff, when do you plan to run this comment period? Uh, we would ideally start by the end of this week. Um, so we're setting up the Engage Missoula website now. And so uh, we have to make a few small edits that were requested, um, some slight map changes from the CLAC meeting yesterday should take a day or two, and then hopefully before the end of this week, it would go live. Thanks, Margie. Any other questions for Jeff? Any questions from the general public? There's no questions. Thank you, Cassie. Hey, with that, I would entertain a motion. This is Danny. Um, I recommend we designate a one month public comment period of the draft Bluebird Preserve Recreation Special Resource Management Plan. Thank you, Danny. Is there a second? This is Aaron. I second the motion. Thank you, Aaron. Any discussion?
Any discussion from the general public? No discussion. Thank you, Cassie. Hearing none, can we get a roll call, please? John. Aye. Sonia. Aye. Wendy. Aye. Danny. Aye. Margie. Aye. Aaron. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, CELAC. Thank you, everybody. We're going to now move into our presentations. And um, Donna, I will let you decide on this. We have Shirley up next for a recreation update. If you feel like we would need to move item 3.3 above that to make sure we get that in and divide the time in half, I'm open for that as well. Um, I think uh, since Shirley has her entire recreation team here, I'd like to give them the Great. time. And really all we wanna know from Park Board is we have four seats that are open in April. And if you already know, some of you have already responded, if you could just send Cassie an email. Uh, love to keep all of you, don't get me wrong, uh, but we thought we'd do one big recruitment instead of multiple recruitments. That's it. Thanks, Donna. All right, Shirley, you are on the stage. Hi, everyone. <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for inviting us to come and highlight the recreation division. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by having Meg uh, pull up the, the PowerPoint. And so I'd really like to, uh, I'd like to reintroduce our, our recreation program staff. Um, I feel so fortunate. Um, and I know this department benefits greatly and the city benefits greatly from having such an enthusiastic, professional, caring, and totally empathetic group of, of individuals that, that provide the planning and programming and facility management for the recreation, parks and recreation. Um, they really believe in community and customer service um, during the time that they're programming and, and planning events. Uh, Meg Witcher is our recreation program manager. Uh, Tyler Decker is the recreation specialist. And Tess, uh, Tess Netzender has just joined us. Um, unfortunately, we lost um, Gretchen Sutherland to the Missoula Downtown Association. She's going to be the new events director down there for them. So uh, we're, we'll have an open recruitment for that position. Uh, Anna Bruning is our uh, recreation coordinator and coordinates all of our adult programs. Um, we have new recreation assistants that have joined Meg's team. Uh, Joe O'Brien and Noni Cobb. Brian Halterman, um, we introduced him to you a few months ago. Uh, he joined us in just after Labor Day as the recreation facilities manager. Uh, he's stationed out at the fort, but Brian pretty much oversees and, and does reservations for all the sports areas um, that, that have reservations. So um, McCormick, Playfair, and the, the Fort being the primary ones, and then the multi-use sports areas in the neighborhood parks. Um, Trey Magnuson is his um, events and rental coordinator. Eric Seagrave is our um, aquatics manager, and Hannah Shepard, the aquatic specialist. Tori Learn, our aquatics coordinator, and uh, Colin Scalero is the food and beverage coordinator, and he works closely, Colin works closely with both the fort to manage the um, home plate out at the softball complex, as well as the Crazy Creek Cafe at Splash Montana and the um, Fire Line Grill um, trailer. So. And at that, I'm gonna turn it over to Meg to, to uh, talk about her programs. And then Eric will talk about aquatics and Brian will talk about the, um, the fort. Let's see y'all. Hi friends, how are you? It's good to see you in the virtual world. Um, 
I'm going to pull this part up. I'm trying to figure this out. Can you guys all see me and hear me? Yep. Great. Um, thanks, y'all, for your annual five minutes of fame time to talk about the uh, life and what's happened in recreation programs um, with COVID and the pandemic and a lot of social movement um, going through. We've seen a lot of changes to the recreation program um, division. Um, so one of the big things that we really realized is that we wanted to improve our way that we were supporting our intermittent staff, which is pretty much the bread and butter. Those are our lifeguards. Those are our uh, youth youth program facilitators. Those are our swim teach te team lesson folks. Those are our coaches, our site facilitators, all that sort of stuff. So during COVID, we saw that um, the city allocated COVID sick time um, for them for pretty much to take care of if they lost childcare or if they were sick due to COVID. Um, we've seen a drastic increase in mental health related call outs and increase of stress within our staff. And so um, HR opened our employee assistance program for counseling to intermittent employees. And um, as a department, we started incorporating online mindfulness training and working grounding and stress management. Um, so pretty much while MCPS was on remote learning, we had a staff of 40 that worked essential childcare in the last year, 10 hours a day, five days a week. This was why and while MCPS was shut down. Um, and so these employees kept our community members working. They kept our youth engaged. Um, they pretty much were the oil that kept things moving and shaking. And uh, to me, they are our superheroes. Um, during this pandemic. Um, and so if you know of anybody that is a, has been a youth program facilitator during COVID, um, give them a high five because they really, our community owes them a huge, uh, a huge sense of gratitude. Um, while we've seen staff shortages all over the country, we've managed to employ a steady dedicated staff entirely through 2021, 30 to 40 staff during the year and 70 during the summer. Um, and pretty much that's been managed by a formal plan for recruitment and retainment supporting on, uh, focused on supporting our intermittent staff, um, both in their professional development, but as well as supporting them emotionally um, and kind of through a collective work in creating better um, team culture across the, uh, across the board. So that's kind of some, some broad-based uh, administrative stuff that's been going on. Um, another major focus, um, well, in the last decade, but really that we want to highlight on in 2021 is equity inclusion in our programs. Here, Montana, Alex Kim has done an absolutely phenomenal job with the Here, Montana program. Um, and these were kind of his highlights of 2021. Um, representation matters increasingly more and more. And so Alex has done a phenomenal job cultivating a culture and developing our next outdoor leaders and making sure the focus is that our BIPOC community members know that not only is there programming for them, but there are job positions and leadership positions within what we've done, with, within what we do. Um, he has really worked with a whole bunch of other organizations from the Bob Marshall Wilderness to Missoula Nordic um, to Iron Shield out of the Flathead to do cultural workshops and outdoor recreation. Um, and the big news out of here, Montana, is that Alex secured a $2,500 or $25,000 Patagonia grant um, to further support these programs. Um, saw around 100 participants in 2021 in the here, Montana program, focusing primarily on adult population. Goals moving into 2022 is to begin to serve more youth, expand on overnight trips, um, and secure more um, positions within the program. Other equity and inclusion in programs, around a decade ago, we started the Reach More program for people with disabilities. And this is year six of the Reach More Summer Camp program. Um, and it's been really phenomenal to watch kiddos that started with us when they were four and five to now be Entering middle school, um, Ben is one of those guys in the splash pool right there. He's one of those kids we've seen all six summers 
Wheels Across Montana, the program that we work across the state with for adaptive bikes. Um, we saw a drastic increase in participation in that program because more folks wanted to get out and exercise outside. And so um, Tyler managed that program and we had more rentals than ever before. Um, the last piece of this is that we really use creative and innovative ways to develop one-on-one -on -one program support for youth needing behavioral mental health support in our programs. Um, much like the school system, we're seeing an increase in behavioral mental health um, diagnosis and symptomology within our youth programs. And we've developed and have been working on a system. So these kids have a place to go after school. Um, and these kids have a place to go in the summertime. And uh, that's been a true community effort. Kind of want to touch on the Lowell Neighborhood Center as part of equity and inclusion. Um, as you guys know, city council adopted allocating um, part of the budget to create a program at Lowell Elementary School to turn it into a neighborhood center. This includes free after school programming for every student that attends. So we see on average um, around 110 kids a day in this program in the after, after school program, but our real broad base goal was to create a multi-generational family support system for our most social, socioeconomic diverse and historically underserved neighborhood. Um, a lot of work has been done with community partners to create a mission and vision and guiding principles. Um, we have partnered with the health department to compile a neighborhood survey for guidance and use in programming. And we have just created this like my dream, a vital and intimate relationship with MCPS, Lowell School Teachers, council, Counselors, Principal, and the PTA. And so what happens is back in the day, kids get out of school and immediately there was um, a wall of communication. So anything that happened after school in their family life teachers didn't find out about it, or um, a guidance counselor, or behavioral mental health, or CPS didn't find out about it. But now, um, pretty much from the moment they step into school until we have programs running until nine o'clock at night, there's this same group of people as a team supporting families in this neighborhood. And so just an amazing family example, one of my favorite families, um, all six kids are cousins. They attend after school program daily. And then grandma and the sisters and all the kids come to our neighborhood center programming. So this was from our family portrait. Uh, Santa Claus came and we did a family craft. And so that's just one example of uh, the multi-generational touch that we're seeing um, at the Lowell Neighborhood Center. COVID-based childcare, like I mentioned, we had a staff of 40 that did 10 hours a day, five hours, or 10 hours a day, five days a week through the entire pandemic while MCPS was on remote learning. Not only did we do that, we worked with the University of Montana and opened a University of Montana specific program for their faculty and staff, which we held in the uh, in Grizz Stadium, which was pretty cool. We got the uh, president's box to run programming every day. We served 520 kids for 10 hours a day, totaling 9,065 participant days. On top of that, we also did a Lowell specific program with 185 individuals for a total of 4,871 participant days. And we also ran a program at Franklin um, for their school out days during remote learning. The big thing here was, is that we turned the old library in 30 days time. It had all of its shelves up and had all the stuff still in it. In 30 days time, we worked to turn that old library into a learning supportive area for school age, school age based childcare. We had 270 unique individuals that we served for a total of 3,696 participant days at the height of the pandemic when everything else was shut down. Um, so I, you know, I know I'm supposed to only have five minutes, but a lot of stuff has gone on and this is a big piece of it. That's our uh, former governor reading to our kids. Um, he came to visit us. That was pretty cool. Camps, we saw an increase of participation despite the pandemic. So where a lot of programs were seeing a shutdown, we saw an increase of participation 
Um, for every one spot that we had open in summer camps, we had 1.5 kids on the wait list. That's just how much people want our programming. Super and Tiny Sprouts, drastic decrease um, in that program area. Um, that was partly because we were so inundated with running other essential childcare programs. We chose to um, reduce the number of programs we were offering that we didn't deem as part of essential childcare to keep our community moving and Super and Tiny Sprouts was part of that, but we're back up and rocking now. Junior Playmakers and, youth, and uh, other youth sports um, from Zootown Derailers, fall of 2020. We tried to run flag football on Zootown Derailers. This was the first uh, outbreak of that COVID outbreak in both programs. And we just decided to call it good after three weeks. Currently, we have already ran Zootown Derailers. We ran a full Junior Playmakers um, season. Um, for basketball and football, but you guys will get those updates at next year's park board report. Um, so we tried, we learned, it wasn't part of essential programming, and so we had to kind of let it go. Kids Fest and Fall Family Fest was comboed together at the fort. Um, we re averaged around 800 folks per hour during the three-hour event, and we had some really great feedback from that program. Um, community members are really looking for outdoor places that they could um, get together with their family. And so we kind of took that approach um, and kind of morphed those two together. Super fun, super good time. Adult programs has kind of been um, all over the place. A lot of it was focused on indoor recreation in the past. And so you guys can kind of see um, outdoor soccer. Um, Anna Bruning has done an absolutely phenomenal job growing those numbers back, and we're looking forward to another great summer there. Um, we had, we started an indoor pickleball season. There was an outbreak of COVID among pickleball players, and so we saw um, kind of that drastically decrease. Um, and then as we let go of city life, we are not running indoor pickleball anymore. Anna has done a great job really looking at recreation-based trends. Um, for other sports that she's running, um, cornhole, spike ball, dodgeball, that sort of stuff. Um, she's really looking at those cool new sports that adults are participating in. So um, our goals there are to really start getting numbers back to where we originally were back in the day, pre-pandemic um, and all that sort of fun stuff. Missoula Movers continues those coffee walks. Um, they are recognized, they are passionate, and they are there every Monday. Anna runs that program as well. Um, we just kind of changed the um, modality of how we are presenting that program. They drive themselves to the trailhead and, um, and we bring them coffee from a different place every, every week. And so year round, those guys are out there. Um, they faced a lot of isolation, lack of physical activity. We had a lot of grandparents who really missed interacting with the world around them. Um, they reported they felt less comfortable reintegrating into social activities while other age groups did. Age groups got back at it um, faster in the pandemic. And so we really are stoked and you know really proud that they've continued. Senior Olympics, it it happened <laughs> and they had 574 registered participants. Anna, Trey and Brian did a great job managing this um, amazing program. If you guys see them out and about, Senior Olympics 2022 is going to uh, be kicked off in June this year and uh, we're looking forward to another great year. Volunteers in the parks, some key highlight things. we reduce the number of volunteer programs that we had just because we were trying to reduce close contacts. And like I said, we really had to hone in and focus on essential programs for community function during the pandemic. Pickleball players paid for and installed the new windscreens at the fort. The Rose Society continues to be one of our most passionate volunteer groups outside of Bill Beavis up at Pineview Park, of course. Um, we can attest that he probably has single-handedly given more hours than anyone else um, in the town of Missoula for volunteering for the city. Um, but the Rose Society continue to have regular events and maintain the Rose Garden and Tyler Decker has done a phenomenal job there managing those programs. And we're looking to crank back up volunteerism 
for summer 2022. That's all I got. And I'm going to hand it over to um, my main man, Eric Seagrave for aquatics, unless anyone has any questions and he wanted to interject now. Awesome job, Meg. Meg, if it's okay, I'll have you control the screen or the- I got you. Happen. Okay, great. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, primarily what we're looking at here is comparisons. We went back to pre-pandemic and then post-pandemic. Well, no, we're not post yet, are we? Pre-pandemic and then post once we were able to open again. Um, and you can see, uh, Let's see the the days or the the years didn't show up, but dark blue would be 2019. Um, the aqua would be 2020, and then 2021 would be the green. Um, so you can see that uh, our emissions went down significantly. That's reflective of a two and a half month clo closure of currents during spring, which was, you know, nice for catching up on maintenance, but uh, definitely it's a major. Um, timed uh, and so we lost a lot of visits and then operating with a maximum of only 50 people at a time at splash for the whole summer during sessions uh, but we bounced back uh, some of the changes we made were um, going to two sessions this in 21 um, and we were able to have 800 people at a time which actually turned out to be uh, maybe the way we want to keep things uh, for the future uh, fewer um, people on top of each other, um, and it definitely increased enjoyment at Splash from the patrons. So um, yeah, so we're coming back, okay? You can see we're almost back to pre-pandemic there. Um, we do have challenges to our continued growth, uh, primarily staffing. You can see our staff comparison here um, in 2016 uh, with, oh no, again, the, the label didn't come through. But you can see that there's a complete decrease um, from where we used to be to where we are in 2021. And so we're running the same numbers of um, kids through the water and adults through the water right now, but we're doing it with fewer staff. Um, so definitely it's a challenge. And this decrease, you can see what's happening pre-pandemic. So there is something out there and it's not just in Missoula, this is a national, um, definitely statewide um, in conversations. People are having a lot of trouble getting lifeguards and uh, swim instructors. So other challenges are our aging facilities. The uh, 50 meter needs a new pool liner and we are working on um, getting that replaced probably this fall with some patching going on this spring. Oops, can you go back one more please? Thank you. Um, the filters at the pools are um, aging and um, dripping. So we're looking at uh, needing to address those in coming years. And then the chlor chlorination systems are also um, the end of their lifespan, um, which is a smaller repair, but um, something that just be heads up for. We're also seeing a lot of competition for space in the pools uh, as we are losing facilities in the town um, with say the women's club closing down, they had a swimming pool. Um, others, uh, facilities struggling with staffing. Um, we have seen more people coming to us to try to keep their programs alive and um, uh, tailor them to our facilities. Uh, the women's club in particular, we were able to absorb um, a quite a few, I would think it would be in the 60s or 70s. Um, water aerobics uh, participants and which in, caused us to schedule two extra new classes in order to keep them at the times they were used to working out. We also have scuba that wants in, kayak wants in, and um, we're trying to balance all of that. Uh, next page, thanks. Okay, so steps we have taken to address challenges. So in particular with the staffing, um, we've worked with the department and human resources to increase wages, moving to a $12 start pay per hour, which would be um, people that we are hiring that they know they want to work at the pool, but they don't really know what they want to do and they don't have um, any certifications. 
once we bring them on and hire them, we train them. And um, when they obtain those higher level certifications and are capable, um, they uh, take um, high, other positions that pay higher. So um, our lifeguard positions pay more than the 12. They're in the $13 range. And our uh, AFLs, our aquatic facility leaders who are head guards, are more in the um, upper 14s. So also um, the um, intermittent staff, as I believe Meg mentioned, um, they have some sick leave and uh, vacation pay now benefits that they're able to earn after a certain period of time of working. We're also working right now to create two full-time lifeguard positions that um, will hopefully entice more uh, uh, people with experience to a position and uh, where they can have a living wage. Um, we also switched our uh, swim instructor rate from paying them per hour to paying them per class, which uh, in, um, gets them to uh, take more classes on and uh, um, you know, make themselves more available for um, teaching more lessons. We're cross-training our existing staff to help with guarding and maintenance. In particular, Colin, um, our concessions coordinator, is helping out by um, lifeguarding at the pools in the fall and winter. We establish flexible scheduling for staff and reduce the quantity of staff needed daily through utilization of this session recreation swim lessons at Splash Montana. We altered the current fall winter spring program to reduce recreation swim times on days where we had historically low attendance anyway. So we're, we're fitting our program in order to suit the staff that we're able to get right now. It's not really the place you want to be. You want to be the opposite. You want to be adding programs because of staffing, but we're kind of swapping that around. Um, we did the RFP for the pool liner, as I mentioned, and um, we're working with user groups to locate access to the facilities at alternative times. Okay, one more page. Um, and here, um, this is kind of going into that idea of keeping the sessions even afterwards. 2019, you can see it's down really low because we're only allowed 50 people at a time. Um, but in what we've been doing by going to 800 per session, um, we have fewer facilities where the facility felt felt overrun to participants. Um, it aids with our scheduling as we have fewer staff to schedule because we have only 800 people in the water instead of possibly 1,500. Um, it's easier for patrons to find chairs. The water quality is improved because you don't have all the people in the water all at once. Um, 800 people per day still accounts for historically, I've gone back through every single day we've had Splash open and only once did we have more than 1,500 people in one day during recreation swim. So by 800 in two sessions, we're able to accommodate 1,600. So we're still accommodating for the max number of people we can have. We're just not doing them all on top of each other. Also, um, it improved, it just, in the end, it, it improves the quality of the visit for the patrons with negligible reduction in average attendance. So um, just as a heads up, we're looking to keep this going even after um, COVID's moved on, which will hopefully be someday soon. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Any questions for Eric? Eric, I have Eric, one. I have one. Oh, oh, go ahead, Sonia, sorry about that. That's okay, John. Um, my question is, and, and just because I'm trying to understand, what do you think the difference is? Like you have Meg, who was easy, you know, was able to find employees, but then the pool can't. What What do you think's going on there? I, I think there's a certain reluctance um, among first-time job users to take on the responsibility that lifeguarding uh, portrays. And I say this um, from having spoken with uh, individuals uh, who, you know, apply to positions and didn't want to move across. And also on a personal note from my oldest daughter who uh, trained as a lifeguard, worked for the grizzly pool as a lifeguard and then stepped down from that. Um, so this is both personal experience and um, um, I guess, just general um, picking up tips here and there is there's 
they don't want to be responsible for the lives of others. Something that we're trying to work with, you know, you don't, you want to make it a fun, but you also never want to lose that idea that, Hey, you know, it's not just a fun. It's also, there's a seriousness. So it's trying to find that balance. Thank you. Any other questions for Eric? Eric, I had one. Meg, would you go back to the first uh, slide, the bar slide? And that one, yes, thank you. I'm just trying to make sure I'm reading this right. Does does the bar do the bar graphs indicate the one on the left is that the daily attendance actually exceeded pre well pre pandemic 2019 numbers, but on the right the revenue actually went down even though the numbers of participants went up. If that's true, how do you account for that? Um, so it sort of would probably depend on the age of the person because there's different fees coming in. So maybe we had more children come in um, rather than adults. Uh, it could also refer to, um, um, that's, it's actually a good point there. The attendance is up, revenue is down. I, I, initially I looked at it and I thought maybe there was some, a greater amount of people went for the punch pass and the pass cards than in the past. And maybe that, uh, some savings that they may have re realized might've brought overall revenue down, or I didn't know yeah. if it was an increase in the uh, scholarship programs or what might've accounted for it. It could also be a um, error in the um, adding them up where we're breaking them down into individual numbers. Um, oh, okay. And then if you also look at the rentals, um, it, perhaps we applied some of the visits to the rentals and some to others. There's also, um, we, you know, we had, uh, we got very creative um, and it's again, thanks to um, the uh, business administration team with Parks and Rec, we were able to have people register online um, pay online and then come in. And it's very possible that some of those numbers are missing um, through this process. All right. Thank you very much. Back to you, Shirley. All right. Um, now we're kind of short on time, so I'll try to keep this uh, short and sweet. So I'm fairly new, as you all know, I've been here about six months. So I went through and I've counted out at the fort 18 different activities and sports that I've either witnessed and watched or put in some form of rental. And as Donna said, if you build it, they will come. They certainly have come, uh, came to the fort and I'm probably missing some of those activities in there. And also with that, um, I've counted over 20 user groups that have consistently rented from us over the course of the year. And looking at this graph, for our rectangular fields, uh, obviously the pandemic has caused a little bit of an issue for us, but I believe we're coming out of it as you look at FY21. And if you're gonna compare 19 to 21, I think as we move forward, we're gonna be more closer to the 19. I think we're gonna far exceed that. I think the, the challenges that we're going to have is finding enough space for our rectangular activities out at the fort. Um, I think when it's all said and done, we'll be completely full looking for other avenues to uh, rent our fields or find some more rental opportunities out there. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. And I think the pandemic really affected the softball community and the renters, the user groups um, in, in whole. As you can see from FY20 to FY21, it was really cut in half. And it was primarily, we missed a, almost an entire season and moving forward, I do ex expect us to get more between FY20 and F FY19. I think we'll settle somewhere in the 1600 range there. And we're also looking for other opportunities. Anna and I and Trey have talked about potentially adding some activities out at the fort to uh, kind of entice um, more use on the, on the five plex and field six and seven. Uh, you can move on. Now pickleball. Pickleball is the fastest growing sport in America, and it really, really isn't close. 
And as you can see, the pandemic hasn't really, uh, really slowed down pickleball hardly at all. In fact, um, between Trey, Anna, and myself, we've tried to figure out ways to utilize the courts a little bit more. And going into this season, we're going to be offering uh, monthly tournaments uh, with the exception of July. And I think our user users are going to really enjoy that opportunity. And I know Anna's also looking at other opportunities to add some lessons. And we're going to also host um, a couple of clinics this, this summer. And to kind of wrap up uh, with the fort, I firmly believe as we keep moving towards uh, the past the pandemic, uh, we're going to see an uptick in all activities to the point where we really will be short on space, whether it be rectangle fields or pickleball courts. I think we'll be looking for ways to actually utilize a little bit more of the softball fields uh, because I do see that kind of leveling out. Any questions? Thank you, Brian. I got to work with Brian just a little bit on the turf management group. He got to come in the middle of that. I appreciate your efforts on that, Brian. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Brian, Eric, Meg, or Shirley? So, so let me just wrap up by show, by uh, highlighting the special use permit. We we more than doubled special use permits between FY20 and FY21. Um, the the system overall is is wildly popular. <laughs> And, and people's uh, creativity of new activities is boundless. Uh, next slide. The shelter reservations um, continue to grow at the fort, um, as well as the other facilities in Missoula. Um, you can see they, they almost doubled. Next slide. And this is, this is the... Um, the balance of our shelters. And you can see that, that uh, Bonner, Bonner Shelter still ranks <laughs> supreme. Um, it is the most popular shelter year after year after year in our system. So next slide. Um, we, just wanna, we just wanna thank you guys for all the support that you give us and and uh, in conclusion, we want to do a shout out to the uh, business finance team for all the support they give the recreation division. They really, uh, they make what we do so much easier. So thank you. Thank you, Shirley. We're coming up on two o'clock. Um, we do have a couple of additional presentations and discussions. Uh, Donna, you already addressed the, um, board recruitment issue. Um, would you like to say anything in regards to the strategic planning update? Yes, um, we are looking at doing strategic planning with the park board. And uh, right now I'm looking at potentially April 28th, which is a Thursday or um, May 12th or 13th. And if the board uh, would please consider um, sending to Cassie or me, uh, if any of those dates do not work for you, uh, we could probably start in the afternoon and go into the evening, but we wanted a good um, six hour block. The other thing we're trying to do is we're hoping that we, a couple of you, um, hate to say this, have told us that this um, will be the end of your term in April. And so, um, and at the same time, you've advised us that it would it would have been wonderful if you didn't get to participate in strategic planning, had you. And so we're going to delay that strategic planning. So I might be kind of leaning toward that May date. Uh, so you, so the um, we have the new park board, if you will, or whichever members are returning, uh, getting to take part in strategic planning. And we'll have Cassie and I'll send out the dates to you again, but. Um, anyway, we're looking at April 28th or May 12th or 13th. Great. So um, we didn't get to do the subcommittee report and we're missing your director's report again. Uh, we might have to look at a way to make sure we're getting those in uh, in the future. Um, 
Are there any other future or held items that folks want to bring up before we adjourn? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion. I move we adjourn our board meeting. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. Anyone opposed? As Dale would say, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.